Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining this morning. If you feel that the landscape for African capital raising is changing, then you'll find this webinar very interesting and informative. My name is Alan Wood, and before I became the Global Head of Business Development earlier this year, I had the pleasure of driving the Africa Agenda for Jersey Finance for over five years. It's been an amazing journey, and I'm very excited about Jersey's role when it comes to supporting African capital raising over the coming years. Now, it'd be remiss of me not to tell you a little bit about Jersey Finance. My organisation works in partnership with the government of Jersey to promote Jersey as a well-regulated, internationally cooperative jurisdiction. From a business development perspective, we have representatives in London, Hong Kong, Dubai, New York. And we embrace a very strong flying model to Africa, India and China. Jersey's relationship with Africa is very broad from a political, commercial and cultural perspective. Over many decades, Jersey has built strong connectivity across Africa by supporting both inbound and outbound investment for private and institutional investors. Our promotional efforts have generally been in the three big economies, being South Africa, Kenya and Nigeria, but Africa does pan-African business. Back in 2014, Jersey Finance commissioned an independent study, Jersey's Valley to Africa, to look at the contribution that Jersey could make to Africa's development. And whether international finance centres be, can be a catalyst for growth in developing countries. The report that found over, over the next 30 years, Africa would need about 85 trillion US dollars for infrastructure to support its growing population. It found that the current levels of investments was not sufficient to meet the requirements and it estimated that 6.1 trillion of capital would need to come from outside of the continent in the form of FDI. At the time of the report, Jersey was already facilitating about 15.5 billion into Africa, into countries such as Kenya, Uganda, South Africa and Egypt. The report argued that Jersey could provide African nations with access to much greater investment to support economic growth and job creation. In our rapidly evolving global markets, the choice of fund domiciliation has become an increasingly important issue for both investors and fund managers looking for efficiency, stability and transparency. Jersey Finance has therefore commissioned African Business Magazine to deliver ind an independent study to understand the emerging trends for fund domiciliation and African capital raising, and particularly with a focus on South African fund managers. We have some excellent content today with some wonderful speakers. The rest of the webinar is split into three sections, and I'm delighted to say that, first of all, Dr. Tesne Mezni, Head of Strategic Advisory at Business Intelligence at IC Publications, will be talking first. Desne is the author of the report and will deliver her findings um, in the first session. Then we'll move on to a panel session, which will be moderated by Cindy Valentine, International Fund Partner at Simmons & Simmons, and she has some excellent speakers both on the LP and GP side. And I'm sure that you'll find that a very interesting discussion. And then finally, Elliot Refson, the head of our funds uh, division here at Jersey Finance will talk about Jersey's offering and how it complements the findings in the research. It just leaves me to say thank you very much for joining today and I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Welcome. It gives me great pleasure to present this research to you today. I'm Dr. Desne Marcy, the author of this report. This research is a development on from the 2015 report, uh, Jersey Finance uh, Value to Africa, where the opportunity to facilitate capital flows to the continent was explored at a macro level. And this report also follows on from last year's Jersey Finance report that was commissioned from IFI Global and Fund Domiciliation. In this report, we aim to go more granular and unearth pragmatic market findings for funds, and investors to make these aspirations around the Africa opportunity and wider global capital flows a reality. Even though starting from a low base, the opportunities for capital raising in Africa are substantial. The past two years have seen unprecedented capital commitments to Africa in foreign direct investment as the region becomes more economically and politically strategic. 
In September 2018, both China and the EU committed substantial sums to the continent. China pledged 60 billion US dollars to African partnerships, the European Union pledged 45 US billion dollars, and the UK alongside an ambition to become Africa's biggest G7 investor by 2022, pledged 5 billion US dollars in foreign direct investments as part of its global Britain strategy. With the Western moral panic over China's role in Africa, Japan's not insubstantial influence is also often overlooked. African Business Magazine found that Japanese overseas development assistance through JICA to Sub-Saharan Africa in 2018 comprised 15% of Japan's total global spend with commercial FDI at around $9 billion in 2018. And not to be left behind is Russia which announced ahead of last year's inaugural Russia-Africa Summit in Sochi in October 2019 that its commitments to the continent had quadrupled to 20 billion US dollars in 2015. There is a role for international financial centers or IFCs to play in extending their financial expertise into these investments alongside private and institutional investors in a cost and tax efficient setting with support from development finance institutions. And this is the driving rationale for this research. We wanted to get a sense of how this capital can be deployed alongside current trends in capital raising and fund domiciliation. The shifting geopolitics introduced by Brexit, Trump, and now also by the COVID-19 pandemic is reconfiguring Africa's place in the world and driving its rapid ascendancy. One important consequence is that Brexit and Trump have brought home some inconvenient truths that political risk is not idiosyncratic to just Africa and so-called emerging markets, but rather that political risk is now a feature of markets everywhere. South African fund managers are ahead of the curve with these opportunities, and the past two decades have shown that private South African private equity expertise has been facilitating investment into retail, consumer, real estate and infrastructure investments across the wider African continent, typically partnering with DFIs from the UK and Northern Europe, but also with investors in South Africa, the US and Asia to drive economic development with often spectacular returns. Let's go now to the report. Our research design used a methodology incorporating semi-structured interviews which we use to compile a snapshot in both qualitative and quantitative dimensions. As you will see, our sample comprises over 60 C-suite or partner level executives. The majority of the fund managers that took part were private equity firms with a connection to South Africa and also international vanilla equity portfolios from traditional asset managers as alongside their alternative private market strategies. On the investor side, our sample is taken from all over the world as South African managers are raising capital globally. Given the impact nature of these investments, the majority of funds were raising from DFIs and family offices in Europe and the UK, and a smaller component are raising in the US, and as even fewer were raising in Asia. For this reason, our investor sample is taken from the EU, UK and US, comprising mainly DFIs, as said before. Let's look now at the overview of the findings. Our survey looked at the drivers of domiciliation and capital raising from many dimensions. First, we find that the choice of jurisdiction ultimately rests with LPs. Among LPs and DFIs in particular, situated in the US, UK and EU, 100% of capital is invested internationally, and given the substantial war chest of such investors, their portfolios are not limited to Africa. These preferences are set out in this slide showing LP jurisdictional spread. We can see here that LPs have no particular preference to using a particular jurisdiction, provided the level of governance and regulation is sound with no major flags. That being said, there remains some resistance against some EU vest investors against IFCs, particularly alongside the push for ESG investing. While governed IFCs such as Jersey should communicate their governance credentials actively to such investors. However, for the typical South African private equity fund investing into Africa, many LPs use Mauritius 
for that geographical context, and this has been the status quo for many years. This will, though, be complicated, as we will see in the panel, by Mauritius still being on the EU blacklist at the time of writing. We now go to the slide showing the results of the GP survey on jurisdictional spread and preferences. As we can see in this slide, among our samples, GPs had around 60% of their capital committed internationally, with managers having a connection to South Africa, but their funds or special purpose vehicles were domiciled across onshore and offshore jurisdictions. Here we can see that the majority are in Mauritius, but also around 30 to 40% in Caymans, and Sub-Saharan Africa is also a quite big component, with a majority of that being in South Africa, where many funds are raising capital domestically, and a smaller subset of around 10 to 15 percent of funds also domiciled in the EU, predominantly Luxembourg, Ireland, Jersey, and Guernsey. The next two slides show the factors leading to ultimate domicile. In this first slide, we can see the LP drivers of domiciliation. Ultimate factors leading to the choice of jurisdiction is hence also LP or investor led. And this is determined by some key factors of set up looking at drivers of domiciliation, such as familiarity, cost, tax neutrality, regulation and governance, and the quality of local service providers and non-executive fund directors. We find that of these, top of mind for LPs is the quality of the legal and regulatory framework, given the industry trend focusing on transparency, the push uh, for AML and KYC, and substance provisions from the EU, resulting in increased regulatory reporting and costs, which will only be further increased by the recent push for ESG, which will be incorporated mandatorily into investment decision making for funds investing into the EU, from March 2021 through the ESG disclosure regulation. We also find that, interestingly, the political and fiscal stability is an increasing factor given the aforementioned geopolitical tumult. And in this next slide, we can see the GP drivers of domiciliation. We now come to substance, which is described on this slide. We did not ask LPs about substance as this was less relevant to them operationally. But for GPs, as regards to the 2019 EU substance provisions affecting domiciliation and BVI, Caymans, Jersey and Guernsey, the majority of respondents were aware of the EU push for this requirement and the majority would add more employees if needed. However, one GP warned that if the provisions around substance become too onerous in jurisdictions, requiring international offices and so on, that might force a review of their using the applicable jurisdictions. Such continued trade-offs between regulatory complexity and cost are going to become more and more important for determining competitiveness. This is apparent in the mental model of value we discuss next. In this next slide, we see a mental model of jurisdictional value. One respondent said that the increasing costs around the reporting for transparency, it become harder and harder for jurisdictions roughly in the middle, like Jersey and Mauritius, to sell their offering as some funds and their investors would mainly go for the so-called gold standard of option of Luxembourg and Dublin and the top right quadrant, which also represents increased regulatory complexity and cost, or else a small majority will opt the right light touch regulation on the other end of the continuum in the bottom left quadrant and suggested a sort of rough mental model of jurisdictional value that you can think about thus. Within this context, managers overall expect to use EU and offshore jurisdictions more, given the increased in impact, interest in impact investing, driven by ESG-led investing, and crucially, a better understanding of the risks and opportunities of doing business in Africa. These intentions around future use of EU and offshore jurisdictions are shown in this next slide. For those South African managers who already use raising capital in Europe, the majority are using private placements because the AIFMD provisions are, in their opinion, inconsistently applied and incoherent for non-EU fund managers. Those who have tried and are raising would really like to see 
AFMID become less draconian and more smooth for EU, non-EU managers or some alternative solutions. In addition to these worries, low and negative interest rates across EU is also causing a major frustration, increasing the cost of capital and not really offsetting the high yields in Africa. This was supported by a in the industry trends, which I will discuss now. The main industry trends we found um, in this context of competitiveness were, as I said before, the increased complexity and cost of regulation and reporting, the rise of ESG being pushed actively by DFIs in Northern Europe, ESG and impact investing, though resulting in more awareness of the African opportunity, the Caymans remaining dominant for the US and Mauritius for Africa, due to aggressive marketing, lower negative interest rates, and political stability amid Brexit, Trump, and COVID-19, which we will discuss now quickly in the macro findings as we finish up. The next slide shows whether our respondents think COVID-19 will affect capital raising and domiciliation. As regards Brexit and COVID-19, these twin peaks of market volatility remain concerns. Brexit is a concern for those with exposure to the UK, but the pandemic is becoming a hindrance for capital raising and particularly for fund exits. Besides these frictions, managers and investors remain wildly optimistic about the African opportunity, but more thought leadership is needed to increase knowledge about the opportunity and gain further momentum. There's a limited window for jurisdictions outside of Mauritius to signal value, while that jurisdiction sorts out its blacklist. But, should it sh but what could happen, though, is that Mauritius sorted out its blacklist issues and could come back more resurgent. Uh, while being able to facilitate capital between Asia, Africa and Europe. But well-governed jurisdictions such as Jersey can still distinguish themselves by quality and governance. As one manager told us, he never had a problem raising capital from the EU, US or Asia using his Jersey structure. Thank you. I now hand over to the panel, which will be moderated by Cindy Valentine and some experts in the LPs and GPs sector in South Africa and worldwide. Thank you so much. Good morning. My name is Cindy Valentine. I'm a partner at Simmons & Simmons, which is a, a law firm in the UK. I focus on setting up vehicles investing in Africa, whether that's private equity, permanent capital vehicles, GPLs restructurings, incentivization, um, the full remit across various se sectors. I generally act for fund managers um, setting up vehicles investing into Africa or acting for um, investors uh, investing in those vehicles. Today, we are going to just have a discussion with, with our panel in regards to uh, domiciliation of funds uh, in respect of Africa, and in particular, what uh, investors and what fund managers consider to be efficient, st uh, stable, and transparent. And we're going to look at the, the key factors surrounding that. On the panel today, we have our um, we have Fadi Basser, who is an um, investment manager at CDC. We have Peter Mason, who is a counsel at, and a partner at Rockwood Private Equity. Derek Roper is a CIO and Managing Director at Novar Equity Partners. Tim Streeter is the Head of Investor Relations at Pidge. And Shlanganiso Monkwanazi, who is a Director at MediCapital. I'm going to ask them just to introduce themselves. Um, and tell us a bit more about what their, their businesses are and um, where, if they have funds, where those funds are domiciled. And if we can just go in the order of uh, speakers on the slide, we can start with Tim, please. Hi, thanks, Indy. Um, I'll just go and give a bit of context about uh, Pitch, uh, Pitch, the private infrastructure development group. Um, so it was set up by four governments back in 2002 uh, the governments were the UK, Switzerland, Sweden, and the Netherlands. And subsequently, we've been joined by Germany, acting through KFW, Australia, and the IFC. We're not so much of a fund, but more of a development institution, like Desne was saying earlier on. And we use blended finance as an instrument to facilitate uh, the provision of infrastructure uh, in frontier markets. And frontier markets for us are located across sub-Saharan Africa and South and Southeast Asia. And rather than uh, pursuing financial return per se, our objective is really about development impact and uh, the, uh, fulfilling the um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. 
Um, but one of our KPIs is about uh, uh, crowding in and catalyzing as much private sector investment as we possibly can. So uh, in terms of quantum, um, our governments have, have uh, the governments, uh, our member governments have contributed around $1.4 billion uh, to PIDG uh, since it was formed back in 2002. And those have been deployed to infrastructure projects uh, through six group entities by means of grants, um, early stage equity uh, through uh, companies called Infoco Africa and Infoco Asia, uh, through by means of long-term debt through the Emerging Africa Infrastructure Fund, uh, which is based in Mauritius, and we avail guarantee capacity uh, through Garanco. And the projects, which number 157, um, at the project level, um, we've uh, we've crowded in. I talked about uh, PSI, private, um, sorry, uh, uh, crowding in private sector investment. Uh, that has reached a, a figure of 33 billion since 2002. Cindy? Thanks. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, Peter, can you just give us a bit of background on Rockwood and what you guys do? Sure, Cindy. Thank you. Um, my name is Peter Mason. I'm a partner and counsel at Rockwood Private Equity. Rockwood was established in 2013 when we spun out of APSA Capital, which was essentially the Barclays Capital representation in Africa at the time. And we introduced into our fund two international investors, and we had one large local pension fund investor. We had a, an enterprise value at the time of about eight and a half billion rand. And we are, it was a closed fund, and we have realized two of our assets and are in the process of realizing the remaining three and we as a private equity fund focus predominantly on secondary market opportunities predominantly or primarily in the industrial and services space thanks Peter. um Fadi, can you just can you give us a bit of background on cdc and what you do at cdc Hi, thank you, Cindy. Um, my name is Fadi Basir. I'm an investment manager within the Africa Fund of Funds investment team at CDC. So just a bit of context on CDC. CDC is the oldest DFI in the world, 70 years old. Um, we're owned by the UK government. We're effectively the UK's development finance institution. We invest primarily in South Asia and in Africa. Um, with this panel being focused on Africa, I'll, I'll talk and touch a little bit on that. So in Africa, we invest across different types of funds, private equity, private credit, and venture capital. And this cuts across generalist funds, sector funds as well. Um, our exposure to Africa, and, and by exposure, I mean net asset value and on drawn commitments, is roughly about $2.3 billion, and that cuts across uh, 90 plus funds and in 31 African countries. Uh, more broadly, CDC has a balance sheet of about 6.5 billion pounds. Um, and uh, specifically, we have offices uh, across the continent. So in addition to our UK office, UK office, we also have a presence in South Africa, in Kenya, in Nigeria, and further representation across other markets on the continent. Thank you, Cindy. Super, thanks. Um, Derek, would you mind giving us a brief intro? Uh, thanks, Cindy. Um, yeah, I'm Derek Roper, the founder of Novare and Chief Investment Officer. Um, Novare started 20 years ago, and we're an investment management business in South Africa and the rest of Africa, uh, investing on behalf of uh, institutions, pension funds uh, mainly, uh, ac across different uh, geographies and, and asset uh, classes. Uh, we in Africa, we predominantly a real estate uh, company or fund uh, that develop real estate in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, excluding South Africa. Uh, we set up uh, our first funds in Jersey back in 2003. So we've been in Jersey for a very long time with a lot of experience there. Around about 2007, we set up some funds in, in Caymans. And in 2009, we set up our, some of our funds in, in, in Mauritius. Uh, 
So yeah, uh, that's a bit of background. Thanks. And last but not least, uh, Shlango Niso. Thanks, Cindy, and uh, uh, afternoon to everyone. Uh, nice to see Peter, Peter Mason on the on the panel here. We last did a deal in 2008, a long time, and um, I haven't seen him in a few years. Uh, he keeps no. looking younger and younger. <laughs> I had more hair then. Uh, <laughs> uh, Medium Capital is uh, about 17 years old. Uh, we started in 2003. Uh, we're based in Johannesburg. Uh, we are a uh, private equity investment management business. Uh, we invest uh, uh, in mid-market companies, um, uh, primarily in South Africa. We raise capital from local and international institutions. Um, our, uh, we currently um, uh, raising our fourth vehicle. Um, however, our first two funds uh, were uh, domiciled in South Africa, our third vehicle, um, has got a dual structure with um, uh, a local um, a vehicle in South Africa and a, a Cayman-based uh, uh, vehicle. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, so, so I think we can just dive dive right in. Um, and one of the first questions I have, and Tim, I'm going to ask you this question. Um, obviously, the pitch has quite a number of uh, platforms and structures. Um, can you tell me, in your in your view, and obviously you deal on a one-on-one -on -one basis with investors constantly, what do you think the key factors are that um, will determine where a fund manager will will set up um, point for uh, creating an investment vehicle into Africa? Sure. Well, in in Pidge's case, um, we're led by members. I don't think it's going to be any surprise to you. Um, just as as was picked up by the survey that um that Desne was talking about earlier on um and i guess we always will be so um mauritius is the seat of the pitch trust which is the the um, umbrella organization it's also the seat of Gar the corporate seat of garanco and the eaif um singapore is the seat of uh Infica asia and as i say the choices um that were made as to where they're located very much in line with the findings in the survey. So the jurisdictions have to be well regulated, um, well regarded, uh, robust and familiar, flexible, stable. Um, they have to have a, a, a good support network. And I think in our case, proximity to the target markets um, is also very important. Connectivity, these days, um, the, uh, the uh, Te telecoms infrastructure is is pretty important. Um, language, um, the ability to respond to to queries very quickly, um, which obviously the time zone uh, helps. Um, given that Mauritius is quite close to um, Africa on one side and close close enough to to to, to Asia on the other, um, so all that gives us the assurance, I suppose, that that reputational risk. Uh, is is minimised, and the operational risk is close to close to zero, um, and that enables us to get on with the job, which we're which we're purpose for, rather than spending too much of our time worrying. Indeed, um, and now Derek, you you mentioned that you have structured funds in a couple of jurisdictions. You mentioned uh, Mauritius, and you mentioned uh, Cayman, and you mentioned Jersey. Um, what were your driving factors um, in looking at those three jurisdictions? Yeah, Cindy, I think, you know, when we when we started it, you know, uh, uh, you know, many years ago, I think, you know, obviously investors were driving it then as well. But I think over the years, you know, uh, the reasons for choosing certain jurisdictions has definitely changed. You know, I think back in 15 years ago and, 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 and 10 years ago, you know, I think there was a lot more focus on, on cost of ease of setting up structures uh, and and tax treaties specifically, you know, I think these days, as we've seen with this uh, report, you know, there's a lot more focus on regulation, governance, uh, KYC, those type of things, you know. So I think the reasons for choosing a specific jurisdiction, even from a from a LP perspective, has changed over over the years. And uh, yeah, you know, so when we were choosing these, obviously it was very much driven by investors back back in the days, and I think. 
obviously now we are re-looking at, at at our structures you know it it it, it becomes more difficult and, and and costly to run so many different jurisdictions and makes sense to have you know less jurisdictions you know but i think the challenge is to find one or two jurisdictions that's acceptable for the majority of of global investors and and i wonder peter maybe if you can just give us your view on this um obviously you you have um european investors um and AI FMD obviously plays a, a large impact on where um, fund managers decide to set up. Either they're going to um, set up onshore and become fully authorized AI FMD or um, market as a third country fund manager, um, which I imagine most of you do. Um, do. Do you have any views on that? Yeah, I must tell you, AI FMD is a bit of a headache for a non European fund manager. Um, yeah. We, I, I'm really only speaking from a Rockwood point of view here as to why we choose a particular jurisdiction and what would influence that thinking. And by and large, it's about recognizing that as an emerging market, we are competing with other emerging markets for funding from global investors. Um, most Many global investors, despite the fact that we may think they do, don't know very much about South Africa. Frequently, they're going to want to follow a particular gatekeeper into South Africa. Um, and so our challenge is to to make their lives as easy as possible when it comes to investing. And that means that when we choose the jurisdiction for the fund, we would have to go to something or some place which is familiar, um, which is stable. From our own point of view, uh, we obviously cannot go into anything which looks like it's uh, on a blacklist. And that makes Mauritius difficult. I would also say to you that Mauritius, to be honest, is not always um, an environment or a jurisdiction which is that well understood by some of the, the investors that we encounter. Uh, we have other issues like language. Um, we have issues of cost. And what that tends to lead you to is to a, an environment like the Channel Islands, Jersey or Guernsey, or perhaps Isle of Man. And really the choice between, between Jersey and Guernsey frequently comes down to your fund administrator and the convenience of doing business there. So certainly from our own point of view, that's the, those are those are the the, the, the factors which would impl or influence our decision. Or many sure. other factors. And uh, and I think I think certainly if if we're looking at um, AI FMD and regulation, I think one of the predominant factors that will come out of that is is cost. Um, yeah. could you just give us uh, your views on what, what you think are the, the, the key factors that um, impact? Obviously, you, you've, uh, you've got funds in two different jurisdictions, uh, and I imagine you, you've got the Cayman um, structure for, for US investors, but we'd love to hear what uh, your drivers were. No, thanks, Cindy. I mean, I think um, as a point of departure, we would have loved for all our structures to be based in SA because that's an environment that we understand extremely well uh, and we can uh, we can manage um, but I think uh, in support of what uh, Derek has said and uh, and, and, and and Peter um, I think the primary decision of going um, um, and having a, a structure outside South Africa is to uh, is to um, uh, try and put together a vehicle that's attractive to to a broader set of uh, institutions so um, in our case in, in in terms of trying to raise money outside South Africa, um, we're obviously looking at, at, at Europe, um, but also uh, concentrating a lot uh, on the U.S. market. Um, and um, uh, in, in our case, with regards to the Cayman, I think the, the basic things that uh, Tim has spoken about, Derek has spoken about, uh, I think in terms of um, um, a, 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 let's say, uh, using my own words, uh, trust in um, the system, the rule of law and the legal system, tax transparency. I think all of those um, you can take with uh, the Cayman. But why specifically we uh, we went there is essentially its proximity to the U.S. market and the fact that uh, there's a clear preference from U.S. investors of that particular jurisdictions. Uh, from our side, the considerations were obviously cost. Um, and whether we can find um, advisors that can um, navigate the environment and help us uh, hold our hand and help us to 
to establish the structures and manage the structures uh, appropriately. Um, and so we've been quite fortunate to, um, to, to, to have that. And I think it's worked uh, uh, extremely well um, um, for, for, for the years that we've, uh, we've, uh, we've had the jurisdiction. Uh, Derek, I think, raised uh, an important point about uh, a time zone. So uh, perhaps the time zone would, would favor Mauritius or maybe um, uh, Channel Islands and Jersey, as Peter was, was said, the time, time zone difference is obviously uh, larger with, with regards to the Cayman and, and South Africa. So that's a, a practical uh, uh, challenge. Um, having said that, I think probably where we had serious pause for, for, for thought, the Cayman was on to a list of, uh, um, list of non cooperative uh, uh, jurisdictions from, for, for tax purposes. So there was a huge concern for us. Um, some of our LPs, in particular DFIs out of U Europe, raised that as a, as a significant issue. Um, so uh, I guess now that um, they are off the list um, as of, I think, September or early October, um, that um, uh, the pressure is sort of off uh, in terms of reconsidering um, those particular structures. So I'd probably highlight that as, um, I guess, strategically important for, for um, you know, the Cayman or uh, we haven't gone into, into Mauritius, but we did, uh, we did uh, consider that option um, especially when uh, uh, we had uh, this issue about the the the, the Cayman. And and uh, I think that's that's a great starting point just to jump in on the Mauritius side. So obviously Cayman's had its issues being on a blacklist. Mauritius has now been put onto the EU blacklist, and potentially this creates opportunity in other jurisdictions such as Jersey, Channel Islands, um, onshore EU. Um, so I'd just like to examine just briefly. Um, how you feel that um, Mauritius being on this blacklist has has impacted um, how how people can consider domicile. You know, Mauritius has long been considered kind of the gateway to Africa, and certain international finance institutions um, will only invest through Mauritius because they consider it the only African jurisdiction which they'll invest through. Um, you know, on the other hand, there's there's another IFI who who has very reluctant to um, invest through Mauritius as they consider it a bit grey. So, so I think there's there's varying um, views on it. Um, and uh, I wonder if you could just run us through, um, has, has uh, Mauritius being placed on the blacklist impacted how you think about where your current funds are, structures are domiciled, and what you'll look at in the future. Okay, Fadi, as, as the uh, uh, DFI on the panel, um, it would be very interesting to hear your views. Obviously, what we've been hearing quite consistently is that um, jurisdiction is investor-led and different investors have different views um, and investors from different jurisdictions like the US might want a Cayman, but the EU might want some other vehicle. So can you just give us an overview um, and whether you're talking from CDC's perspective um, or have a general perspective on what European DFIs um, feel that would be helpful? Sure, thanks, Cindy. And, and I'll probably speak from CDC's perspective as some of you know, um, different DFIs, including some in, in, in the EU, um, feel very differently about, about certain jurisdictions than we do. Uh, but generally, I think most of the uh, specificities when we look at fund domiciliation have been covered already by my co-panelists. I would say for CDC in particular, I think we will probably uh, focus on, on, on areas with respect to, to regulatory issues, um, governance, uh, and the various, uh, various lists that we, we've discussed. Um, I think in particular, we, we tend to uh, stay clear of, of, of blacklists. Um, and, and that cuts across EU blacklists or uh, OECD, uh, FATF, you know, financial action task force blacklist, etc. But we do have a bit more more flexibility when it comes to you know quote unquote grey lists. And, and I think Mauritius is, is is a good example. So I'm happy to to talk to Mauritius, uh, Cindy, if you'd like. Sure. So I think sure, when, when it comes to, when it comes to when it comes to Mauritius, uh, as you all know, they were added to the EU uh, list of high-risk third countries, or, or, or we've come to call the EU uh, AML uh, list, and, and that really follows from uh, the addition of Mauritius back in February 
to the Financial Action Task Force um, jurisdictions for increased monitoring. And so for us, what that means is we're not specifically precluded from investing in you know, Mauritius uh, domiciled funds, but we simply need to take extra uh, procedures and steps when doing our due diligence, what we call enhanced due diligence requirements. And what that means is that we'll spend a lot of time trying to understand the controls uh, that, uh, that a fund manager or any other type of vehicle would have with respect to anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing risks. So we'll spend a lot of time doing additional due diligence on that. In addition to that, um, we will also, uh, I just, there's a heightened risk from a reputational perspective, uh, you know, following the, the 2019 Mauritius uh, leaks expose. And so from that perspective as well, uh, there'll be additional, additional requirements. And there, you know, we're really following what the Financial Action Task Force recommendations for Mauritius are. And, and for us in particular as, a, as an investor, that's really around making sure that, you know, general UBO, so ultimate beneficial ownership, there's transparency in there and really understanding uh, what's happening from that perspective. So so, so for CDC, Mauritius is, is, is not a no-go, um, but for others it is. So as, a, as an investor, also trying to mobilize other, as an investor trying to mobilize other other LPs, um, we, we we do take that into consideration, and 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 obviously that affects timelines and 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 various steps that GPs need to take, and often what we see in in some instances is you know various vehicles being set up underneath the fund, and and different uh, different LPs will uh, sort of uh, streamline and 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 push their capital through 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 a, through a different fund that they are they are comfortable with. I think. Cindy, just one final point for me is, you know, whilst obviously GPs take into consideration LP uh, LP appetite and LP um, 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 sort of uh, preferences, we are to a certain extent also led by by GPs. So we will ultimately receive a proposal that has a domicile on it, and we'll take a look. Um, and and so to that extent as well, it is it is very much a DP, GP decision on where where they want to be led, uh, where they want to be based. And 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 what we do is make sure that um, that ticks in some of the boxes that I referred to earlier. Okay, that's helpful. So I think from what you're saying, um, CDC remains flexible when considering the jurisdictions and will generally be led by where the GP um, is proposing. Um, but certain other DFIs or IFIs, you know, may not have the flexibility to go into jurisdictions which are on a, a grey list. Correct. Tim, perhaps you can just give us your your view from the, the GP side on how you view um, What's, what's happened with um, the Mauritius being placed on the list and whether that would impact your future fundraisings or your current funds or well, whether yeah. you're just going to ride it out? No, I think for the moment we're carrying out a watching brief over, over the situation. Um, yeah. There are uh, elevated um, KYC checks, um, for example, on some of, the, some of the payment flows, as far as we know, associated with that of the, um, the operational aspects of, of, of Mauritius. But for the moment, there's no there's no big change from us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think I think I've seen that myself. I think uh, quite a, a number of clients who are already fundraising in Mauritius and are continuing um, as, as they have, but certainly um, people who are looking to start a fundraise are, are looking closely at, at jurisdictions. Um, Peter, what um, can you just give us a view on what other jurisdictions are being considered in the current context and environment? that you've seen or heard of? I can only speak for ourselves again, Cindy, but I, I, I would agree completely with Tim and with Fadi, particularly where uh, we, you're not going to go and canvas all of your LPs as a, as a GP setting up an offshore fund about where they would prefer to be. So we mm. would definitely make a proposal and a suggestion to our LPs as to um, the jurisdiction to which they should invest. However, that decision is going to be very strongly informed by who our potential investor base is going to be and what we know about them and where we think they're going to be coming from. So by and large, we target UK and um, uh, EU-based investors. And we know that mm -hmm. Luxembourg would be fine, as would the Channel Islands, as would Ireland, um, as would IAM. Uh, ultimately, I think the decision then it would be made by ourselves. 
And our experience, to be honest with Luxembourg, is one that's very expensive. Um, not being an AIF or, or, or a, a licensed AIF in the, in the EU makes life difficult for us. Um, it's, there is also a language barrier, and to be honest, from a legal perspective, there's a very different legal process and legal system which one has to be con cognizant of when you are structuring your fund. Uh, ultimately, when you're making decisions about where to go, you're going to be looking at treaty networks. Uh, it's, I will say that from a convenience point of view, Mauritius as an African fund manager would be ideal, uh, but it's not always feasible and particularly given the recent blacklisting makes life even harder and as I uh, as I as I intimated really what you want to be able to present to your LPs is an environment which can demonstrate very strong governance very strong and deep on the ground expertise uh, you are going to have to employ a variety of directors and experts and the the greater availability of these individuals in environments potentially like Jersey or the Isle of Man, make those jurisdictions probably easier to choose than perhaps a Mauritius would be. I want to go back to the point which, which Nisa raised earlier, which is that yeah. I really as a South African fund manager, it would be much nicer if we could have direct investments into South Africa, were it not one for the rather limited treaty network which we have and two, the unusual legal structure of on comedy partnerships, which you have to spend time explaining to international investors. And frankly, the more DD they have to do on you, the harder it gets is to get the money from them. So make their lives easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're quite right. Um, Thanks, uh, I think ease, ease of jurisdiction is also, yeah, fundamental. Um, okay, Derek, I just wanted to, um, just ask you one last question. Um, given that you're one of the managers who has a jersey structure, how have you found that um, as an alternative uh, and in, in terms of all the, the tick boxes that you need for, for a jurisdiction? And yeah, we've had a you know, we had a very good experience over the past 17 years. You know, I think we've never had any issues uh, in Jersey, uh, you know, and 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 you know, so the experience has been really good. You know, investors had never had any questions or, or, you know, you never had to explain certain things around the jurisdiction. It's well known by, by investors. That was really, really helpful. You know, I think we, we're operating in a difficult market to raise money uh, from, from international investors. You know, and, and one of the last things you want to talk about is, is blacklisting, you know, and explain that to, to potential investors. So I think that's critical for us from, from that point of view. And, and yeah, just one last comment as well that's, that, that we believe is important as well as on exit. You know, we're looking at probably listing in London, um, you know, some of our investments or portfolio listing, you know, and what we've seen is it's just a lot easier if you've got a, a structure in the Channel Islands to actually list on, on, on the London Stock Exchange than, than what it is in other parts. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good point. Um, thanks. I think just to, to cover off with two, two macro points that were mentioned in the study, um, Fadi, maybe you can just give us your view. Has um, COVID affected um, the focus that you see on Africa? Are there certain um, sectors or um, uh, certain types of sectors that are becoming more prevalent or that, in fact, CDC has a, a greater interest in? Thanks, uh, Cindy. Sure. I think we, we, we've mostly seen um, the impact of, of COVID in Africa being to disrupt processes and, and cause delays, whether it comes, whether, it, whether it's, it's, it's fundraising or, or whether it's exits, uh, obviously travel restrictions, as well as some investors needing to make sure that their portfolio uh, fares well during the crisis, um, supporting uh, in, in our case, supporting our fund managers to do that, but at the same time, you know, these month fund managers and GPs spending time with their portfolio companies themselves. Um, I would say that um, from, a, from a sectoral perspective as CDC, uh, we being a DFI definitely have a focus on trying to support um, the infrastructure uh, that, that keeps things going. And, and, and I guess that, 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 
that's one area. Uh, but I think the second area is really trying to support the food value chain from our perspective and making sure that that continues to that continue to operate and 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 we set up various facilities to do that. I think secondly, on on the healthcare front, uh, we 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 also have been you know actively looking to support uh, efforts from that perspective. But I think generally what we're keen as an investment firm to do is to to help reposition uh companies and investees in africa for for the future and and helping them to re to rebuild and to um sort of gain regain lost ground i think we've seen uh quite an impact on growth trajectories for, for some of our companies and and in the case of uh private equity where you have 10-year funds um you know having that disruption can ultimately impact that GP and that fund in terms of an exit within the uh, stipulated PE time period. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's something we're focused on um, and, 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 and we're trying to get capital back into the market, working with uh, fellow investors who, who we can hopefully try and mobilize uh, to, 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 to come back into the market. Uh, absolutely, and you know, CDDC plays a catalytic role in in all those those aspects. So it's it's really useful to hear. Um, and maybe just a last point for you, Shlangoni. So I know I know you're fundraising. How has um, COVID affected your fundraising and your exit strategy in terms of that? Yeah, I think um, um, you know the COVID environment is is quite challenging. Um, uh, I think, as Fadi was saying, that um, um, certainly the immediate impact has been the disruption of uh, just sort of normal processes of uh, engaging with investors and uh, normal flow of decision making and so forth. So uh, we've experienced that um, uh, we've had to put things on uh, on pause for uh, for a few months. So I think it's only now that we're starting to re-engage with uh, a number of uh, institutions and see where they are. And um, and um, there is um, sort of mixed responses. So I think there's a number of people that are looking at the existing portfolios and working very hard on that and uh, not making any decisions, certainly in 2020. So I think the net result is that I think fundraising in this climate is definitely going to be to be longer. So the timetables will be pushed out. I think um, um, one has to be realistic um, in in this environment with, um, uh, as I say, one in a hundred year uh, event, um, I think it's it's important to to take stock and uh, and probably be a bit more 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 realistic and and, and patient. So I think that's what we we seeing. Um, and I also uh, to to, to Fadi's point is that um, in our existing portfolios, uh, fortunately uh, we haven't had any um, uh, you know crisis or significant issues, but certainly the the immediate impact has been. Um, uh, some assets that we had penciled in for exits this year, uh, those processes have been pushed out to uh, potentially next year, and we'll see how uh, the environment sort of is and uh, and 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 recovers. So uh, we will see um, sort of a delay in 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 exits. Um, interestingly enough, I think in terms of um, uh, new investment opportunities, um, there is uh, a lot of opportunity that um, um, uh, we are seeing. Uh, maybe it's a function of um, less uh, equity capital that's that's available in in the market, um, and um, um, I think so. In 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 contrast, I think that there are some interesting opportunities in these in these times. Um, I guess for investors that are um, committed to the long term and um, can see their way past uh, the immediate crisis. Thanks very much. Um, I just want to ask if any of the panelists have any closing comments they'd like to add. Sure, happy, okay. well, happy to, to say I one thing. I think, Sydney. I think um, one of the things that uh, Mauritius and the issues they've had there um, have 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 brought, has brought home for us is that um, we obviously need to think about options to, to Mauritius. Um, while CDC is flexible today, but it does create the opportunity to do that. And obviously for this panel, you know, Jer Jersey is, is is definitely one, you know, that I think people can take away. I think for us, the other thing is is looking within Africa and seeing what other options exist within Africa. Obviously South Africa um, is is plays a big part and and, 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 and and that's a space that we would watch. But I think also there are other parts of Africa um, and in particular Rwanda uh, where we signed an MOU 
there to, to see if we can help them develop a fund domiciliation center in Kigali. And that's something we're excited about and, and just creating the, uh, the, the, the breadth of options for, for, for investors in Africa. So I just wanted to, to, to flag that. That's fantastic to hear. Um, and obviously, it's something we, we always talk about, you know, we need more investment jurisdictions in Africa. And obviously, we do have South Africa. Um, and we have noticed over the last few years, South African ma fund managers bringing international investors into a South African fund uh, partnership, which, which is great. So we can only hope that, that that moves forward on that basis. So thank you very much to all our panelists and to Jersey Finance for having us. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Elliot Revson and I lead the fund sector at Jersey Finance with a mandate to look after the sector from the perspective of strategy, direction and execution. I would like to thank Desne for her excellent insight into the trends in fund domiciliation and capital raising for South African fund managers. To me, the key takeaway of this report are the geopolitical uncertainties brought about by Brexit, Trumpism and COVID as well as jurisdictional uncertainties around cost, regulation and governance. Managers further express specific frustrations around accessing European capital under the AIFMD regime. The choice of jurisdiction lies with investors and the, the report clearly shows that the blacklisting of Mauritius and the openness to look at jurisdictional choice is underpinned by demand for jurisdictions with a robust legal and regulatory framework and political and fiscal stability with a no change outlook. Against this backdrop, I think that it would be useful to spend a few minutes to frame Jersey as a jurisdiction to look at the reasons that our funds business has seen growth of 65% over five years and just over 100% over the past 10 years. According to the latest Monterey report, the private equity venture capital space represents 56.5% of all AUM of funds in Jersey, which is a figure that has grown 144% over the past five years. One of three Jersey funds is now either private equity or venture capital. We are also seeing an increased number of very significant private equity managers physically relocating to Jersey. In point of fact, South Africa represents the eighth largest pool of capital in Jersey with entities such as Stanlib, Ashburton, Novare, Ethos, Westbrook and Stenham having established presences here. To so look at the reasons for this trend. Jersey is an award-winning international finance centre whose reputation and regulation is acknowledged by independent assessments from some of the world's leading bodies, including the OECD, IMF, and the World Bank. This is supported by broad and deep expertise from the nearly 14,000 people, or 44% of the working population who work in the industry. Jersey is a crown dependency of the UK, but has its own government. It offers both political and fiscal stability supported by a sound legal, judicial and regulatory environment. Having been an early adopter of international substance and transparency initiatives, Jersey has the respectability, the stability and the no change outlook required by investors, which is supported by world-class infrastructure highlighted, for example, by the second fastest broadband in the world uh, and supported by broad and deep expertise from the nearly 14,000 people, or 44% of the working population who work in the finance industry. One of our greatest strengths is the ability for our government, regulator, and industry to come together in a room to engage directly, address issues, and to innovate quickly and collaboratively within a robust globally uh, respected regulatory fr framework. This almost unique approach led to our opt-in, opt-out AIFMD stance, the Jersey private fund product, which can be regulated within 48 hours, our response to substance requirements, which were lauded by the OECD, and more recently, our resilient response to COVID and the changes to our limited partnership laws, 
making it easier to port LPs from other jurisdictions to Jersey. One key element of our product offering that sets Jersey apart is our opt-in, opt-out approach to the AIFMD. Being outside of the EU means that Jersey is not subject to AIFMD when targeting investors from the rest of the world. Within the EU, Jersey has excellent, long-standing bilateral relationships with its member states and established market access arrangements by the national private placement reg regimes. And these will not be impacted by Brexit. On the other side of the Brexit equation, Jersey's access to the UK is guaranteed under its UK private placement agreement there. And to augment this, our regulator recently secured continued access to the UK in the event EU law no longer applies, such as in the event of a no deal Brexit. And in this way, Jersey bridges the gap between the EU and the UK in both the pre and post Brexit environment. But this is only a, a part of Jersey's flex, flexible marketing proposition. By the EU's own statistics, only 3% of all alternative investment fund managers are registered to market in more than three European jurisdictions. And that means that 97% of all managers do not market into more than three EU countries. If you're a part of the 3% who market on a pan European basis, or to the retail market, then you will most likely need to access EU markets via another jurisdiction and the full scope of AIFMD or USITS. But if you're one of the 97% who do not market so widely within the EU, then Jersey and its European private placement agreements offer a more cost effective, a faster, and a more efficient solution outside of the full scope of the AIFMD. And this is the reason why there are more than 183 Jersey registered managers opting to market into the UK, uh, sorry, into the EU through the national private placement regimes, a figure that's risen 76% since December 2015. And this growth is reflected in the strong support for the national private placement regimes highlighted in the KPMG's recent pre AIFMD2 report. In summary, our key message is we are a stable jurisdiction with a minimal change outlook with significant and established links to Africa. We offer future proofing around Brexit disruption and a marketing bridge to UK and other global investors. We are complementary to funds in other European jurisdictions by offering parallel structures satisfying a global investor base. We have a collaborative triumvirate of industry, government, and regulator that leads to innovation and collaboration within a robust and globally respected regulatory framework, always adopting international standards swiftly, but pragmatically to maintain our global re reputation. And it is for these reasons, reflective of the forecast for continuing growth in alternative investments, that we will continue to grow our global footprint in the years to come as we continue to become the alternative jurisdictions of choice. I hope that you have enjoyed our session this morning and on behalf of Jersey Finance, would like to thank you for taking the time today.